man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the east. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send an invite, send in, and invite their three sisters to eat and, eat and drink with them. So it was when the, seven days of, when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. So I hope everybody got the chance this week to read through and hope most of you got the nagging email each day to show the, uh, that day's reading. We just read through, uh, if you followed along with the, the church's reading this year, um, we've read through the first four chapters of Job, and in those, as I said, I would be drawing the lesson from every uh, week's reading, and so I, a few days ago, I began to think about all of the topics that really are in there, and I was sitting there thinking, this is so different from what I hear most of the guys when they get up and talk say. They're like, I don't, it's hard to come up with stuff. And I'm sitting there thinking, I have too many things. And because, but I've always thought that. It's like, I hear, I think it might make the difference between guys who preach occasionally and guys who preach regularly. Um, I've, I don't think 50 or 100 or a couple hundred lessons a year are enough time to present all the things I would like to present from Scripture. So it's not, to me, a matter of how do I select something to preach about, but how do I pare down something to present to you? And in something that, resembles, oh, you gave me lots of extra time this morning. I appreciate it. Um, in 40 minutes or so, you know, how do I, how do I pare it down? And so... I want to start with this main point about Job feared God, because the entire book is essentially based on this fact. It says in verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless. Blameless essentially means that there was nothing he was guilty of, or he didn't owe anybody anything. He wasn't a lawbreaker that needed to pay some uh, you know, penalty for having broken the law. He was blameless in that sense. So, so most of us, even though we have sinned, many of us, or most of us, are blameless before the government. We're blameless before our fellow people. Because even if we have done something to hurt somebody, ideally we have, you know, repented. We've asked for their forgiveness. We might have restored something if we broke it or, or lost it. And we would then be blameless. And that's what it essentially means. There was no debt he owed anybody. There was nothing he had done that he didn't repair, in a sense. And that's essentially what blameless means. And that's a really good concept because it's the same word idea-wise, even though it's Hebrew versus New Testament Greek, but about elders. The idea of elders being blameless, that there's nothing that we hold against them. And that's what he was. But why was he blameless? Why was he upright? Why was he a person who tried to do the right thing? I think it all comes down because he feared God. Why did he turn away from evil? Because he feared God. And what does it mean to fear God? It's actually a lesson all to itself. I'm not going to go in great depth on it. But a lot of times people will say, well, it means to respect God. And that is certainly true. But it's not, it doesn't mean just respect. It also implies, though, a number of things. If I fear God, it means I believe He's real. If I fear God, it means that I understand His power, His awesome and mighty power, and His authority. Because it's one thing to know somebody exists. It's one thing to respect somebody. But you probably respect people you have no fear of. 
because they're just not very strong. They're not very threatening to you. But God isn't that. God is threatening. God is a, it is a fearful thing, as the New Testament tells us, to fall into the hands of the living God. In fact, I would connect it to this. When you were, now, let me just preface it for a second, because I remember a, a friend years ago who was terrified of her father. Her father, I don't know, had, had abused her or beaten her. And so she really hated her father. And, and so the idea of fearing God and comparing that to like a fearing or respecting a father really didn't sit well with her. And so she couldn't, she couldn't deal with the idea of fear that, that she could have any fear of God. But I, I suspect that had to do more to do with her own father rather than what God is trying to teach us. But if we understand, even if we have a really good father who trained us well, there was probably a point in our life growing up where we thought to ourselves, if I do this or if he finds out I did this, I'm dead. Because we feel like he could kill us. And when we're little, our parents are that big to us. They're giants. They, they're so big, they're so strong, they're so all-powerful. Now, we grow up and eventually, sometimes we get bigger and taller and stronger, and we realize, okay, well, they were just kind of pretending. No, they were just being themselves. We were just really little. And so, but we still have that respect for them often, even as adults, because we understand who they are. And so... It is true that this means that we ought to respect God, that we ought to honor God. But it means also that I know God is big and powerful and can judge me and hold me accountable. So when you say, if, if I do this, he might kill me, you know, that's kind of literally true of God. He really can do that. Now, he doesn't. He doesn't want to. He doesn't desire to. Desires the exact opposite. But he has the ability to. He's that big. He's that strong. He's that powerful. And so Job had that understanding. That is the essence of who Job was. Through all the difficulties of the entire book of Job, as we're going to read over the next you know, few weeks, we see a man, even in the depths of his suffering, who still feared God. That never went away. And it really is the center. It's also why it is that his fear of God, which is why God even held him up as an example for all to look at. Because he obviously wrote a story about him, didn't he? He didn't just hold him up for Satan and the sons of God to look at. He made him an example for all people. From Moses' time forward, which probably when the story was written down, to help us understand how God interacts, how Satan interacts with the world, and the place that we have in it. Now, lessons that I had from this four, first four chapters. First, godly character. The character of Job had the spiritual care he had for his children, how he was rewarded by God, how he rose ultimately from the depths of despair. And in chapter 3, there a description of how bad he felt. Well, I mean, just one of the, one of the great poetic ex expressions of how bad humans can feel when we are knocked down to our knees emotionally. And that's really what I, I look at chapter three, what, what in a sense, this beautiful description of the awful pain that we can feel in our soul. And he says, but also how not to and how to comfort those who mourn. Great examples there. Also accusing somebody without evidence. And this says, these are the six that I kind of, I'm like, you know, I could talk about all of these in, in depth. 
And like, which ones would I want? I actually asked, you can ask Janae, and you can ask, even ask Forrest and, and Julie. I asked all of them, which ones would you guys like to hear about? Because I'd like the lesson to be something of value to you. Now, this doesn't even go into what I'm guessing. Some of you might read through this section and go, oh, what is Satan like? Right? You look at that, that piques our interest very often when we read through these passages. When you read little bits and pieces about Satan, it's interesting to us. Now, it's not a lesson I would really put together because I think there's not that much we're told about Satan, and there's a lot more about him that we don't know. And so I can only like examine a little bit, and I don't know what to do with it that much. So it's kind of like, eh. it's interesting, but I don't know what to do with it. And then the sons of God. Who are the sons of God who come before God? It's like Julie and I had a little conversation about it. And, and so I, I expressed something. She, she thought one thing. I said, well, you know, think about this. And so, oh, maybe, maybe I'll think about it a little differently. But it's like, again, there are some places you could look at this phrase, the sons of God and Satan, and you're like, but again, it's one of those things that you, there's a few places to look at, but I ultimately don't know what to do with it. There's a lot of, there's, there's more we don't know about than there is that we know about. And so these six were the ones that I'm like, these are the ones I'd li- really like to talk about. Some of them probably come up in future lessons because some of these points will continue to come up in the readings of Job. But I want to just kind of hit at them all really quickly. Um, you know, in verse 1, you, it describes his character. We already read it, blameless, upright, feared God, turned away from evil. In verse 8, he says, when God actually talked to Satan and said, Have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth. A blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Said the exact same thing about him. And, and just let's understand something about Job. If we were to compare ourselves to him, most of us would fall short. But that was true in his time as well. Everybody fell short of what Job was like. It's a little bit like trying to compare yourself to Abraham. You know? And so you look at certain people, even though they were human, they were tremendous examples of godliness in human form. And so you and I aren't going to measure up, but we can learn from him. There's a lot to be learned from him. He's mentioned in the New Testament a little bit. And in chapter 2 and verse 3, you know, same thing. It says, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Now he said that one after Satan has already killed all of his children. He says that after Satan has already destroyed all of his wealth, so that he is now a poor man who has also lost his whole household, almost his entire household has died. The only people we're aware of are three people who come and tell him about his children's death, tell him about the loss of his animals, tell him about the loss of his servants and his wife. Out of, out of what must have been hundreds of people in his household. There were maybe four besides him still alive. He has essentially no wealth. He has no family other than a wife who doesn't seem like that was a positive at that point. And he eventually has friends who will show up and, and, you know, those weren't the greatest of, they didn't give him the greatest uh, month or so as well. But his character in this moment, and he says after he asked Satan that, um, when he says, he still holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without reason. I want you to take one thing as you read through. As we read through the book of Job, we always kind of make the, connection. This wasn't God who did this to Job. Even though Job says the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. We see that Satan did it to him. But even in God's own words, God understands that he was responsible for doing it to him. He says, you incited me. 
and I let you do it to him. And there's a reason for that. Now, it's going to go a little bit into the rewards that God gives us. But that God actually changed the rules. Satan wasn't allowed to do much of what he did by God prior to this. And then God allowed him to. And he did that for our sake, for us, for us to learn something. So Job became, in his own life, a message. Now, don't, this isn't unusual, by the way. You, there are a number of people whom God used to make and, and make, have their lives become a lesson for us. Hosea, God tells him to marry a woman who is a prostitute, who then commits adultery on him, and he keeps taking her back and bringing her back. He had to go through all that to give us a lesson. God was teaching a lesson through the life of that prophet. He did it with Ezekiel. He did it with a number of other prophets whom he asked to do things that were hard, that were difficult in their lives. But they were given to help you and me understand some kind of lesson about how God loves us and how he takes care of us. And so one of the things I would look at do also in, in 1, 4, and 5, the thing he mentions about his spiritual care for his children. Now, his seven sons appear to have all been grown and have their own houses. The daughters appear to be not married yet, and they go to their brother's house for their feast, the feast that they have. But Job is so concerned about the spiritual health of his children that after they feast, He's offering burnt offerings for all of them. Sin offerings, essentially. That they might be righteous before God. Because he understood his relationship as a father to his children. And the, and the requirement God put, especially on fathers, but really on, on all parents, the necessity of you... For your children. And he never said you need to be your children's friend. He said you need to be your children's mentor, guide, helper, teacher. Those things are the things that they only get one set of parents. Now they might have other parents that come in their lives in a, you know, different circumstances that, you know, other people might raise them, adoption or something else. But the people who we come from are tasked with the job of teaching us and caring for us spiritually. Now, um, verses 8 through 10, he says, well, the other thing I want to just kind of mention about his children was in verse 5. After to run the course, it says the very last part of verse 5. Thus, Job did continually. He was always watching out for his children, even when they were grown. Because, and this comes from a, a child, you know, when we grow up, as from, and we become an adult. First, you know, maybe when we're 18, we think, oh, I'm an adult now. And mom and dad kind of look at us. That's really good. Yeah, that's great. And uh, when are you going to start paying for yourself? Uh, but... And then, you know, it's like, okay, you didn't realize, well, we still needed their help. And I get 21, and now we're ready to go. And you're like, oh, okay, how cute. <laughs> and then, well, and we realize that we keep needing them. And for those, especially when we've gotten old enough that we've lost a parent, then we realize, wow, I can't ever go to them again. It's like that, there's something changed. I mean, it, it's a big step because you realize even as an adult, you could always turn to them. You could always look for them, their help, in whatever way they could help. And then it goes. And it, it hits you. And it's different. And it feels different to have them not there. You can't give them a call. But Job 
was always watching out for his children. There's not like, okay, you're an adult, you're on your own, wipe my hands of you. No. Always there. Great, great example for us as parents, that really is our job. We're going to always be there until we can't. Now, um, in verses 8 through 10, he talks about being rewarded by God. And he says, The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God, turns away from evil? But Satan answered the Lord and said, does, God, does Job fear God for no reason? It's a rhetorical question. What's the answer to that rhetorical question? Does Job fear God for no reason? No. He fears God for a reason. There is a benefit to fearing God. That's what Satan's pointing out. He does this because you do stuff for him. And he mentions it. Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? We'll look at that one a little bit more in a bit. You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. All that he had had grown in part because God was actually helping him. God had protected him. He says, of course he fears you, because look at all this good stuff you do for him. Now, he goes on and basically tells him, um, well, he says, oh, go ahead and stretch out your hand, touch all that he has, and he will curse you to his, your face. That's, by the way, why after these things happened, we are, it's mentioned. Because this is what Satan said. He's going to curse you when he loses all these things. It's why it tells us, by the way, that he didn't do it. He didn't curse God. Now, he goes on to question God. He goes on, he says, I'd like to have a, a meeting with you, God. I'd like to have, have a court case with you and show I didn't do anything wrong. But he doesn't curse God. And Satan, essentially, was wrong. And except for the fact that God does reward us in these ways. He has promised these things to us. In fact, maybe at the very minimal, because what, what hedge did God leave for Job? You can't take his life. So he, moved, he, he brought the hedge in, made it smaller, but he didn't remove it. Now, maybe that wasn't so good for his kids or his servants, but God was there for Job even in this difficult time. Now, in chapter 3, I'm not going to go through reading, but chapter 3, as he describes and laments his birth, the day, let the day perish in which I was born, and the night that said a man is conceived, he says, I just wish I had never existed. This is, this, this is horrible. This is awful. The pain and suffering that he felt and this, by the way, isn't like in the moment. In the moment, he said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. This is about after a week of sitting there that he lamented, I wish I just was never born. I mean, you've, you've just lost 10 children. You've lost all the servants in their lives. And certainly there are many of the servants that would have been people he cared for and loved, if not all of them. And all of his animals and he's like it's all gone and the only family still around is saying you ought to curse God and die he's by himself got a few friends have been hanging out for a week but that's, that good time is about to end but he is in the depths of darkness gloom clouds as he describes it I think it's a great description of that, the depths of despair that, that can fall upon many of us from time to time in our life, or, or some suffer from it more often. But this is, I think the, the great thing about it is knowing how this all ends up. This ends up very good for Job in spite of this terrible moment in his life.
in spite of this terrible time in his life. And it wasn't going to be fixed overnight, was it? His end result is he has more children, more wealth, a bigger household. But how long did it take to acquire all that? Did that, did that completely remove the pain of losing 10 children at one moment? How long would it have taken for him to have built up all of that again? He would have gone through years of struggling from this moment, this death that he fell to. In chapter 2, 11 to 13, you know, when we think about the three friends in the book of Job, we often think about, boy, this is the, don't be friends like this. It'd be better to have, you know, uh, enemies <laughs> than friends like this. But let's understand a couple of things. They really were good friends. Now, first off, a man as godly and upright as Job, what, what would his friends have been like? Do you think they would have been just awful people? No. you think they wouldn't have understood anything about God? No. Clearly, in all of their discussions with him, they know things about God. And they understand some true principles about God. They are mistaken over and over again in applying those principles. But they don't really know that. And so in verses 11 to 13, Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him. They came each from his own place. Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, Zophar, the Namathite. They made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and comfort him. They're like his three friends got together. Yeah, man, we've got to go. We've got to go spend some time with him. This is horrible. And it wasn't just a little bit of time. They're not spending an afternoon with him. They're spending weeks with him. And so, these, are re these really were good friends. And they saw him from a distance. They did not recognize him. They raised their voices and wept. They tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word. He looked at him, and he was, at this point, he would have been a bloody mess besides having lost everything. At this point, he's already had all the boils all over, all over his body that he's taken a broken piece of pottery and cut them all open to relieve the pressure of all the boils. And they look at him. They themselves are mourning and grieving and crying at the sight of their friend. And they sat for a week and said nothing. Really, that is a really good friend, isn't it? They make mistakes after this, but they were good friends. And they were wise men, but they were mistaken. And I think it's a great lesson for all of us to realize no matter how wise we become, no matter how much we understand, always remember we might make mistakes and we might be mistaken, just as they were. And so there are things we learn not to do in chapter 4 and verse 2. When Eliphaz begins and says, If one ventures a word with you, will you be impatient? Yet who can keep from speaking? He said, listen, are you going to be able to listen to us or not? It's like it's been a whole seven days since you lost everything. And they begin to correct him or tell him the way he needs to go. The problem is they're wrong, and they don't quite get it, but they're doing, they are applying the things they know to his situation, but it doesn't fit, and they don't get that until the end when God helps them to see <laughs> how mistaken they were. And then in verses 7 through 9, he says, remember who that, remember who that was innocent ever perished, or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the breath of God they perish, and by the blast of His anger they are consumed. Now, in those three verses, there's a bunch of truth. What happens to those who, are, who plow iniquity, who spread evil and do evil? What comes back to them? Well, a number of places in Scripture. You reap what you sow. What you put out there is what others do. And what you get back. That's a completely true principle. 
He says, and, and, and are they destroyed by the breath of God and perish? Yeah. But in the very first ver verse 7, he says, Who was ever innocent that perished? And there, there's actually kind of the, the heart of the mistake. Have innocent people ever perished? Yeah. He, now, they didn't have the whole Bible, right? What did Jesus say about all the prophets? Did any of them go to the graves in peace? No, the prophets never went to the grave in peace. I mean, you think about it. If you knew none of the prophets ever went to the grave really in peace, you'd say being called as a prophet might be, uh, you'd have the response Moses had. Maybe somebody else. I'm not a very good speaker. <laughs> Could you call somebody else, have them do it? Because it wasn't going to work out well to be called to be a prophet of God. Because the innocent have perished throughout time. Even going back to the very first death, was an innocent man killed by his brother because his brother was jealous of him, made him look bad. And so they go on to accuse him of being not an innocent man because innocent people don't have terrible things happen to them. That's the big core of the mistake they make. And it, and it just goes on through all of the arguments back and forth it is the core of the mistake. And it goes to this. Notice that they did what he didn't say. He didn't say, you have done this. What he said is, terrible things have happened to you, and only bad stuff happens like this to bad people. And that just isn't true. But that might have been their kind of experience. That might have been what they had seen. The bad stuff doesn't happen to bad, or bad stuff doesn't happen to good people, generally. But that's not, and it might be generally true, but it's not always true. So, that's why I said I was thankful you gave me extra time. Um, Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. I want to read a couple of these passages for us that kind of talk about this. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, uh, you know, do not provoke your children or bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Um, Genesis 18, verse 19, I'm not going to go there and read them all just because I want to get to Deuteronomy 11. Um, but the talking about Abraham, how he called Abraham and he told Abraham, your responsibility is to teach your children and your children's children. And command them to do what I have commanded you. The spiritual care. That's the spiritual care of children and grandchildren. And by the way, in Deuteronomy 11, and this is actually a par somewhat of a parallel passage, because some of you might have thought Deuteronomy 6, verses 1 through 7, would be a great place to go to look at the concept. But Deuteronomy 11 actually expands Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 7 a little bit. That's why I want to look at that. And so Deuteronomy 11, verses 1 through 21, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but just a couple of things to, to point out. When he was talking to Israel, this is Moses, by the way, in Deuteronomy. These were basically sermons he was giving to the children of the people that came out of Egypt. The book of Deuteronomy was a series of sermons Moses gave just before he died, and the children of Israel moved up and went into the land of Israel into Palestine. And he was repeating much of what he had taught their parents at Mount Sinai when they came out of Egypt in the first place. And that's why the word Deuteronomy kind of means second law. It's, he's giving the law of God again to them. And so he's saying to them, you shall therefore love the Lord your God, keep his charge, his statutes, his rules, his commandments always Consider today, since I'm not speaking to your children who have not known or seen it. Now, notice what he says there, verse 2. You need to consider today, consider the discipline of the Lord your God, his greatness. And he's saying, I'm not talking to your children, which means there's an implication you, you have to do it. Right? And he's going to tell them that more explicitly. But your job is to do that. And so he goes... 
he goes on, he tells him, remember all these things that God did for you and that you need to keep the whole commandment, you know, that I commanded you today in verse 8. Um, and he says, verse 13, if you will indeed obey my commandments, I command you to love your God, to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul. He will give the rain for your land in its season, the early rain, the latter rain. He's going to take care of you. He's going to bless you if you follow him. And so he says, verse 18, you shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart. And in your soul, you shall bind them as sign in your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are sitting in your house, and when you are walking by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them, as long as the heavens are above the earth. As long as the heavens... Are up there and the sky exists above us he says we need to tell their children about God and we need to tell them about his commandments about what he wants and what he demands we need to tell them about what he's done we need to talk to him and we need to talk we don't take them to church he didn't tell them take them to the temple take them to this place to do that no because it's responsibility of every parent to talk about this stuff with your children. The church can teach some things, but it doesn't going to do much in an hour or two a week. Because much of the things children will really remember are the things you said when they were going to bed. Or when they were having breakfast with you in the morning. Or when you were on vacation and having lunch someplace. Those things, things that you at the time won't know, impacted them will truly impact them. You have to be talking about God has to be at the front lit of your eyes every day of your life. Now, many of the Jews took those sayings that he made when he said they, they, those scriptures should be like front lit between your eyes and they actually hung little scripture boxes in front of their eyes and on their foreheads and many of them didn't really know how to actually apply them. Because having them, having them on your walls doesn't mean anything if we don't learn how to actually do them. And so the spiritual care of children has been called upon by godly people from the very beginning. God rewards those who diligently seek him. That's Hebrews 11 verse 6. That we have to believe that he is and that he rewards those who diligently seek after him. This idea of being rewarded by God is actually very common in Scripture. Let's look at a couple of places. And, and first off in Jeremiah, before we look at this, two things that, he, that Satan said God did for them. Hedge for his household. We'll look at a couple of verses there. But I want to read Jeremiah 29, and 10 through 14. Because Jeremiah said this, same idea to the people of Israel at a time when they were losing their nation. So their nation is going away. I mean, really at the, at the much like Job, at the very depths of their, the lowest moments for them as a nation, much like the lowest moments of Job, he promises them that God will take care of them and will reward them. And so, starting in verse 10, he says, For thus says the Lord, when seventy years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise, and bring you back to this place, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Now, could you imagine, I want you to picture yourself, those, those are awesome words, but could you imagine yourself being the people, the adults who are listening to Jeremiah, and he says, I'm going to do this 70 years from now. What would that mean to you? 
not my lifetime. So apparently, this is for my kids. Not for me. I get to stay in exile for the rest of my life. That's my promise. I was like, oh, can you imagine? So from a real, if we were really selfish in how we looked at life and thought of only the self and not those around us and our family and the broader sense of who we are as people, we would think, well, what does that have to do with me? It reminds me a little how, um, oh, forgetting the name is flying out of my head, but the, um, the king of Judah who asked God to, you know, give him more life, and he's like, okay, yeah, I won't kill you. You'll, get, you'll die like so many years from now, or this will happen later, and he's like, oh, well, at least in my lifetime it'll be good. Like, he just promised you your children to have all this terrible evil have fall on them, but it's not going to happen while you're king. He's like, oh, well, great, not, my, not while I'm living. Like, that's not good. <laughs> You as a king would try to make your children and children's children have a good life, not a terrible one, so you can have a nice one. And yet, he's offering this to them and saying, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to watch over you. I'm going to provide for you. It's going to look bad for a while. It will be difficult, maybe for the rest of your life. But I will take care of you. That is the reward he promises. That's the reward for those who diligently seek him, regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in, in this world, whether we have abundance or whether we have little, God can look over us, to watch over us and care for us and protect us. He can give us peace and joy, regardless of circumstance. That's the real blessing that nobody has the power to change my circumstances and change the blessings I have from God. And so look at a couple of verses. We'll end with these. A hedge for the household. In Psalm 3, in verse 3, this is something that God actually says in a couple of places in the Psalms. But in Psalm 3, in verse 3, He said, But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cry aloud. Well, I'll just stop there. That's what David, he writes. He says, you're my shield. You're the one who protects me and sets me up so that others can't harm me. In chapter 34, the same kind of idea comes about. 34 and verse 7, also a, a psalm of David. And he says, um, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. So the angel of the Lord is there. So when Satan came and did all those things to Job, it was only because the angel of the Lord said, Okay, I won't stop you. But God's angel can stop anybody from harming you. And He protects us and our life. He delivers us from the evil. And then look at Psalm 128, this idea of being blessed with increase. In Psalm 128, verses 1 and 2, it says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in His ways. It's a description of Job, isn't it? Now, Job lost everything, but he also gained it all back to us. And he says, you shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. He says, I will provide for you, and it will go well for you if you fear me and walk with me. It really isn't a surprise to see people who are godly Increase and have abundance. And by abundance, I don't mean, I don't mean you know, multi millions of dollars or billions of dollars. It just means more than I need. That I can help others, right? Because when I have abundance, one of the things that's called upon me is that when I have more than I need or my family needs, now I have more to help others, to give to others, to have an abundance. God can provide that, and He, He says that. 
He will do that for us. So when we practice godliness in our life, it's not a, it's not a surprise that our families do well or we do well at a job or in work or when we're godly. Because that is the end result, typically, of people who practice goodness and who walk in the light. 